So thank you, Yinke, for inviting me to um, share my paper, my ongoing research um, on art manifestos and collectives in Southeast Asia. I must say, when I first received um, Inca's call for papers, I was really excited. I thought it was a really, really important topic. <coughs> I'm not sure if I was the first one to respond to you. You were. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I thought it was a really, really important topic um, to be discussed, and it's true that art historians tend not to look across our sister fields of literature, um, comics, um, poetry and so on, um, which I feel is really, really important um, for us to really look across uh, different fields. And in this way, in my paper, look across different discourses produced from these different fields, or rather, or we can call them cultural fields. So, um, so my paper today traces and examines the discursive struggle between the new and the real as floating signifiers, privileged elements in the exhibitionary discourse whose meanings are constantly negotiated and contested. So discourse is conceived as the fixing of the meaning of elements in an order of discourse, which I term as the exhibitionary discourse. A discursive moment is understood at the moment when hegemony established is established over the meaning of an element. The floating signifiers of the new and the real interact and frame are the free floating elements, such as the avant-garde, modern, the social, political, the conceptual, and the conceptual in the exhibitionary discourse. So this, the, the discursive struggle for hegemony in the exhibitionary in post-war Southeast Asia is driven by art manifestos as a specific mode of exhibitionary discourse. And the artist collectives that were actively <coughs> producing art manifestos across Southeast Asia in the, in the 1970s is examined in this paper. Um, and they include the Modern Art Society in Singapore, the Kai Sahan in the Philippines, the Gerekan Sinopa Baru or the New Art Movement in Indonesia, and the Artist Front of Thailand, of course in Thailand. And these were kind of um, artist collectives that proliferated across the region and they produce art manifestos, and hence, and hence my interest in them. So Chantel Moore's discourse theory is based on a premise that discourses are ways in which we talk about and understand the social world. Reality is accessible to us through knowledge categories, which are in turn a product of discourse. All discourse and knowledge is his historically and culturally specific and discursively contingent. So discourses are conceived as fixations of meaning that determine a particular way of representing the world. For a move, the discursive struggle arises from competing discourse which aim to achieve hegemony and determine the meaning of language in a very fixed and particular way. This discursive struggle for hegemony is never permanently fixed because discourses are constantly transformed when challenged by other discourses. So here, um, I've also introduced quickly um, a sense of the historical context that I'm looking at across Southeast Asia that I will also talk about uh, in my presentation. For example, the student protest movements across the region in the 70s, from the Malari incident in Indonesia, the University Tamasat Massacre um, in 1976, the first quarter storm in the Philippines, um, which was in, in tandem with the kind of artist student radicalization as well. And here we have, of course, the Black Manifesto, Black December Manifesto in Indonesia um, that produced the Group of Five kind of a manifesto. The Garikan Superbaru that I mentioned, PIPA, that was kind of an offshoot of the Garikan Superbaru, the Artist Fund of Thailand, the Dharma Group, Kai Sahan, uh, Anak Ulam, the Gangau Village Art Group. And um, Towards the Mystical Reality was an exhibition, not a collective, but nonetheless, Again, you know, um, part of what I'm kind of looking at in the context of the 1970s. And um, most recently, um, Penguin, so it's really classic, yeah? So, you know, they just published uh, this book, uh, Why Are We Artists? 100 World Art Manifestos, um, selected by Jessica Lack. And I was really intrigued, and so I kind of like screen print, um, printed this page of the content page and it has manifestos from Southeast Asia, very well represented. Um, of course, we have, you know, Generation Anak Alam from Malaysia. Yeah, we have Sulaiman Nisa and Pia Dasa's Towards a Mystical Reality. We have the Artist Front of Thailand, the Karekan Sri Baru, 
um, Kai Sahan, exactly all these um, artist collectors that produce many vessels in the region. And I was wondering, how in the world did she know? And I looked at the bibliography and I realized, oh, she read Patrick's paper on uh, manifestos. Um, so, okay, so it's all there. Um, so it's wonderful that, um, you know, this art manifestos, you know, from Southeast Asia have a strong representation in this book. Which comes to my point about um, what is an art manifesto. So I think the art manifesto is a rhetorical device um, issued by an art group, individual or collective of, of artists, usually associated with the avant-garde, posturing as militants perhaps, or radicals to a potentially wide audience with the intention to shock, propagandize, revolutionize, and thus subvert the status quo defined by ideas, aesthetics, and systems. As a specific type of exhibitionary discourse, art manifestos have been perennial in the history of Western modernism. So artists' collectives, like the you know, Futurists, the Dadaists, Surrealists, Situationists, Fluxes, and so on, you know, have issued manifestos as public declarations of their artistic ideas and intentions. As a literary genre, art manifestos employ text to present ideas on art within the social context. The relationship between the art manifesto and society can be traced back to the art manifesto's historical relationship with the political manifesto that preceded it. Political manifestos are ideological documents issued by collectives or individuals with the intention of changing society. So in this way, art manifestos also function as vehicles for carrying political statements and allying with political, social <coughs> and cultural groups. So next I will look at two very important, um, in a way, lexicons um, that I see um, being kind of repeated um, in art manifestos, which is the new and the real, as floating signifiers. And here I quote from two um, art societies. So first being the Modern Art Society in Singapore. And uh, in a preface, they claim Strictly speaking, and I quote, Strictly speaking, realism has passed its golden age, Impressionism has done its duty, Fauvism and Cubism are declining. Something new, and I emphasize new, must turn up to succeed the unfinished task left by our predecessors, being the Nanyang artists, and so on. Uh, we do not mean to belittle the achievements of traditional art, but we certainly do not agree with those who stick to the old cause. So in a sweeping movement, they have left their teachers aside. Uh, from the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts and now you know it's a new age that they have declared at least by the Modern Art Society in 1963 and then we have another manifesto by the Kai Sahan which means solidarity issued in 1976 and for the Kai Sahan they proclaimed we recognize and I quote we recognize that national identity if it is to be more than lip service or an excuse for personal status seeking should be firmly based on the present social realities and a critical assessment of our historical past so that we may trace the roots of these realities. We shall therefore develop an art that reflects the true conditions of our society. So this last line is really important and the notion of realities being a notion of the real. So the Modern Art Society in Singapore had in a single breath proclaimed <coughs> the end of successive styles of painting, realism, impressionism, fauvism, and cubism in the history of art, while legitimizing their claim of being the preeminent avant-garde art society by declaring abstraction as the new style of painting propagated by the society. At the same time, the Modern Art Society Art Manifesto had effectively set up a binary opposition between the traditional and the, the tradition and the modern. The search for the new envisaged as the next stylistic breakthrough or the subversion of existing aesthetic conventions in the art world by means of the heroic avant-garde artists working in the modernist vein features prominently throughout the history of modern art in the West. The foreword to the 1963 Modern Art Society exhibition explains the aesthetic ideal based on the new as a universal formalism. And I quote, the, the main concerns of modern artists are the beauty of form, harmony, of rhythm and creativity. Unquote. Form was defined as, and I quote, living lines, breathing strokes, unique structures, or moving colors. Unquote. Beauty could be attained by the arrangement and composition of the elements of form. In a bold statement, hoisting form as a preeminent criteria for art. And I quote, We, the Modern Art Society, appre appreciate the artwork as long as they are composed and arranged artistically. Unquote. Form was also proposed as a universal language of art as its elements 
color, shape, line, and so on, need not carry culturally specific meanings, relying instead on instinctive impulses and subjective feeling that were transcendent and universal. With its proclaimed universality, and I quote again, the modern art society, modern art is therefore an effective and essential means to promote better understanding amongst the various countries of the world, end quote. The exhibitionary discourse provides entry points to understand how media and genres engage in a discursive struggle to fix the meaning of the new as a floating signifier, which was challenged by one of its members, Cho Cha Hyang, a, conceptual, a conceptualist who produced a conceptualist discourse <clears throat> and was first published in the Chinese newspaper before being republished in the foreword of the 1974 Modern Art Society annual exhibition catalog. This foreword, written by Zhou Zhang introduced the conceptual discourse of, and I quote, and you can read it here as well, contemporary art has in fact reached the point when artists are prepared to adopt anything as a medium to work with. What is important is not the execution of an artwork, but the idea behind it. Similarly, the non-art attitude in art itself has become a new notion, a new concept of contemporary art, and quote. In fact, Chai Hyang famously uh, mailed a set of instructions to the Modern Art Society in 1972, and with the work titled Five by Five, The Singapore River, uh, which was never shown at the Modern Art Society exhibition, um, was one way in which Chai Hyang was kind of challenging the fixing of the meaning of the new in terms of form by trying to expand it into the conceptual. Next, so the Kai Sahan is an, it's an, it's an artist collective that emerged within the context of the radicalized left-wing student movement in the Philippines and was um, particularly led by the NPAA or the United Pro Progressive Artists and Architects formed in 1971. Um, it was also very much influenced by the nationalist youth that recru recruited young artists from these student movements including the Kaiser Han for the armed struggle for a proletarian, proletarian revolution led by the Communist Party of the Philippines. The Kaiser Han Manifesto differed from the modern art society in its conception of art history. It does not see art as grounded in the history of modern art that is driven by the Western avant-garde movement, um, consists of the unfolding of a series of stylistic changes. Instead, it sees, it, it sees art history as embedded in the social realities of the Philippines, as you remember that quote earlier. More specifically, it believes that art is socially and politically, um, art as being emerging from socially and politically context from the conditions of the real. So the real as a floating signifier is based on the actual realities and conditions experienced by the people of the Philippines. The Kaisan ideal was an art that reflects the true conditions in our society. And here you see um, the first quarter storm um, and also part of the anti-Marcos protest movements led by artists like David Mandela and so on when they, can, they were kind of um, um, protesting outside the cultural center, sorry, the cultural center of the Philippines or the CCP in Manila when inaugurated in 1969 as a project of Imelda Marcos um, and therefore they kind of protested against that uh, and then later on we have the uh, first quarter storm at the University of the Philippines in which students were kind of protesting against martial law that was imposed by the Marcos. And here we have examples of works by Kaiser Han that were more social realist kind of paintings. So a comparison between the new and the real advanced by the modern art society and the Kaiser Han respectively reveal how both conceptual categories were embedded in the art manifesto as a mode of exhibitionary discourse produced by exhibitions. The discursive struggle between the new and the real in art manifestos in turn intervenes with the changes in the, and intervenes and changes other elements of the exhibitionary discourse, the avant-garde, the nation, notions of the tra nation, tradition, history, and conceptualism. Interdiscursivity between exhibitionary discourse and other orders of discourse from the domains of popular culture, such as songs, literature, philosophies, for example, Marxism or left intellectual movements and worldviews, has intervened with and changed and pushed the boundaries of exhibitionary discourse by introducing new linguistic terms and concepts drawn from indigenous or local sources. And I'll be talking more about this um, later in my presentation. So he has also contributed to actively decolonizing exhibitionary discourse by providing multiple frames of references, including local and regional discourses. The modern art society was not alone in articulating an exhibitionary discourse that aimed at determining the meaning of the new in the context of the binary of the East-West as a binary format, uh, binary thought format during the Cold War. 
other competing exhibitionary discourses of the new were articulated to contest the exhibition discourse of exhibitions. Like the Modern Art Society, the Kai Sahan appropriated the art manifesto as a vehicle to propagate their exhibitionary discourse, but deferred in adopting a critical approach to the new as a floating signifier. The Kai Sahan attempted to modify the meanings of the modern and the avant-garde by widening the scope of what art could be and by including alternative ways of thinking and making art that departed from the exhibitionary discourse that was centered on formalism. Western abstract expressionism had created a hegemonic discourse that circumscribed both exhibitionary practices and the depoliticization of artistic practices, seemingly free from all constraints, um, promoting freedom, individualism, and subjectivity. Socially engaged artist collectives like the Kai Sahan propelled the decolonization process in Southeast Asia in the domains of culture, knowledge, production, and, and also in terms of frames of uh, mentality. Um, by focusing on the region, local context, and social conditions as the basis for the production of new perspectives, practices, and thinking, seeking to decolonize the international discourse of ex abstract expressionism, exemplified by American, America as a hegemonic center through the employment of alternative discourses that contested the new. The Kaisahan was not alone in contesting the notion of the new in Southeast Asia. The Karekan Sinupabaru, the New Art Movement, contested the notion of the new when it came to being as a result of the Black December men, um, movement within the larger context of student-led protests, such as the Malari incident earlier in the year. So the Malari incident in 1974 was a series of student protests across universities, mostly in Java, but centered in Jakarta. Um, that then, and they protested, of course, against the new order. Um, there was very much part of what um, Suharto had built. And on the 31st of December 1974, a group of artists protested against the major, inter major um, Indonesia painting exhibition, awarding prizes to paintings described as decorative and consumerist and excluding experimental works. Um, so this work was kind of like recreated recently um, by FX Hasono, who was involved in make remaking the Gerekan Simpabaru exhibitions back at um, EC in uh, Jakarta. So, the young rebels of this Black December movement, including FX Asono, Hadi, um, Muni, and others, they, deli um, they delivered flo this floral wreath that you see here, but this is of course a re remake to the judges with a ribbon attached that included the following statement, and I quote, condolences on the death of Indonesian painting. Um, As a result of the meetings between artists from Bandung, Jogja, and Jakarta, um, the artists from Indonesia were able to further the ideas of the Black December movement and gave birth to the New Art Movement in 1975. So in their manifesto, they declared um, the five lines of attack. And here um, are the five lines. Um, and I'll just quickly go through them. The first is really about the elimination of sharp, sharp distinctions between pain, pain, painting, graphics, and sculpture. So here we are able to see a kind of already a desire to break across disciplines into you know, graphics and, and other forms of cultural production. And second, abandoning the concept of fine art, which is again you know, very much relevant to uh, the symposium today, looking at ways in which um, the notion of art itself could be expanded um, and is no longer you know, con conceived in an elitist way in the form of fine art. Which comes to the third point about liberating art from elitist attitudes. Um, and I think the fifth point, the fourth point was of course, you know, they had to rebel against somebody and so they were rebelling against their teachers, which they felt were being you know, uh, conservative. And lastly, uh, that the most important point to research into Indonesian art history um, and a rejection of universality uh, by going back to kind of emphasizing the importance of the Indonesian context. So the new art movement's attack on elitist attitudes targeted the avant-gardist narrow conception of art as fine art that excluded other notions or definitions of art and aesthetic values and philosophies embed embedded in traditional art forms. The new art movement turned towards alternative contexts to expand the, the scope of art um, beyond the, nar the narrow confines of the academic systems um, based on Western moderni modernist categories of art dominated by practices of painting and sculpture. So the new art movement rejected the decontextualization and depoliticization of art under Suharto's new order regime. 
the new art movement privileged concept over techniques by elevating intellectual engagement or critical attitude and approach to rethinking art making, its practices and exhibitions that display art. So while the modern art society fixed the meaning of the avant-garde and the modern framed by formalism, faced challenges from the articulation of the conceptual as the new modern and the new avant-garde that expanded the concept of art beyond a linear progression of styles originating from the avant-garde movement in the West. The new art movement effectively advanced an exhibitory discourse of the new that provincialized the West by, by multiplying its frames of references from other discourses. The notion that the new was contested in exhibitory discourses in Southeast Asia. So rather than adhering to a unified notion of the new based on the Western avant-garde movement, artists developed alternative ideas of the avant-garde and the modern that contested the new by expanding into how we think and practice beyond formalism and into the direction of the conceptual. The challenge spearheaded by art collectives like the New Art Movement widened the scope of art by offering exhibitionary sites of resistance to Western-centric internationalist exhibitions that propagated a shared global and universalist avant-garde. So alternative ideas based on Asian philosophies and aesthetic values from traditional art forms um, and even so-called non-art forms being like, for example, the graphics, um, comics and so on, multiplied frames of references through which the new in Southeast Asia could emerge. It was, however, the contested idea of the real that offered an even more compelling challenge to the Western avant-garde driven by um, exhibitions. So contesting claims over the new in exhibition discourse cannot be separated from the real, which quickly became the battle cry of another group of artists. The exhibitionary discourses produced by the United Artists Fund of Thailand employed the real as their conceptual weapon to engage in a social, institutional, and political critique <coughs> to effect real social change that drew from diverse discursive sources, including popular culture. So the Artists Fund of Thailand was really produced within the context of um, the whole series of student protest movements from 1973 to 1976. Um, the Artist Fund of Thailand, in fact, was established in 1974 to commemorate the 14th October 1973 uprising led by student intellectuals, NGOs, and they published an <coughs> art manifesto in 1975 outlining their aim to oppose art produced for capitalist and imperialist consumption. So recently, um, not recently, one year ago, I was at the University of Tamasat Archives, uh, which I strongly encourage you to go if you have interest in studying this period, and uh, they do keep a lot of these translations of <laughs> writings by Ho Chi Minh, uh, Marx, and so on, all these left kind of intellectuals, um, including Mao as well. Um, and these were all translated into Thai and they were widely circulated. Um, and so these are some of these um, books that you can still find there. They are very rare because <coughs> many of these books were actually burned in the 1970s and kind of almost, you know, Nazi kind of you know, mass burning of books um, that happened. Um, but thankfully, many of these books have survived. Um, most of them are in private collections, but um, the University Tamasa Archives have managed to assemble a good collection of many of these um, kind of left um, books, left leaning books. So, um, the artists coming back to the Artist Fund of Thailand's Art Manifesto, um, they adopted the discourse of institutional critique against the structures of the state. Um, and here, and I'll quote them selectively. Uh, focusing on the second part due to time constraints uh, and I quote we who are not satisfied with what the big people have done and we who are conscious of the priceless Thai, Thai cultures Thai culture arts conservation innovation and development for the little people then organize ourselves into the artist front of Thailand our mission is to conserve innovate and develop Thai culture and art and <coughs> make it serve Thai people in the correct ways it should um, so I just want to emphasize on the big people and small and little people because these are kind of terms that we will see um, kind of emerging from uh, discourses across different fields as well. So the Artist Fund of Thailand's first exhibition, uh, which was the Billboard Cutout exhibition, took place in October 1975. He adopted a new ex exhibition practice of breaking out of the white cube gallery space um, and instead organized um, exhibitions along the Rajadaman Avenue and here is, you can see the democracy uh, monument. And so this exhibition was in the public space, in a road, a very important road uh, from which it leads to the Tamasat University as well as the Grand Palace. So it's a very symbolically important um, road and of course even up to today most of the protests or many of the protests usually start from here and then it starts to move um, to the Grand Palace direction. Um, 
So in 1975, the, the artist friend of Thailand organized an exhibition which was called the Billboard Cutout Paintings over, of over a thousand paintings to protest against the American military bases in Thailand during the Vietnam War. This eventually also resulted in the military crackdown and the arrest um, and the killing of many protesters. So the anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist aims of the Artist Fund of Thailand, which engage directly with the public through internationalist exhibitions in public spheres, redefined the role of the artist as that of an activist who had to produce art for the people and incite social change. Its reclaiming of public spaces created a dialogue that cohered with its interdiscursive appropriation of other orders of discourse in the public domain, such as literature, poetry, <coughs> and uh, popular culture. And here we are able to see some of their works. Um, they are very graphic based, so you can almost see that many of these works do draw from um, some elements of, say, comics, for example, or you know, kind of you know, um, also drawing on certain ideas or aesthetics of um, advertisement. And it was actually intentional for them to kind of adopt a billboard kind of format um, in a way to critique um, the very you know ways in which uh, advertising works, and uh, they wanted to use this as a way of subversion as well. So here we can see the billboards being placed in the Rajadaman Avenue and it was kind of a ritual whereby all these billboards were kind of brought, carried by um, the students and the artists front of Thailand and they kind of installed in between two lampposts. And so if you go to Rajadaman Avenue today, you still see the two lampposts, no, rather the whole row of lampposts there. And some of the billboards were also placed on the buildings um, alongside the road. And so you can see you know, other examples of the billboards. So um, discourse from popular culture provided another side of interdiscursivity. So Man and Buffalo was a popular Thai song um, based on a poem by uh, Pomisak and musically arranged by um, Surat Chai Chantimat. It was sung by the, the caravan, which is kind of a group of folk. How do you describe it? Kind of folk group, folk rock. Folk rock. Thank you. Um, one of the most popular groups that were part of the um, Songs for Life movement that emerged in, the, in Thailand in the 1970s. So the lyrics of this popular song appropriated discourse from Marxist philosophy by identifying the bourgeois class as oppressors. And you know, I'll just briefly mention the lyrics of um, this song, Man and Buffalo. So, and I quote, um, These are the lyrics of music of death. For having had our manhood broken by the bourgeois who, elevating themselves in the superior class, have devoured the excess value of our labour, contemptuous of the peasant class, reviling us as savages, <coughs> truly and surely the oppressors will die. So this is the lyrics of their song. Um, the interdiscursivity derived from appropriating the Marxist discourse of class struggle anchored in the use of Marxist concept of bourgeois as exploitative class and an enemy of the, of course, the working class. Ties with the concept of the big man, little man, um, uh, the use of these two terms in the manifesto of the artist front of Thailand that I've talked about earlier in its accentuation of a class struggle um, between the have and the have nots that calls for social action and even revolution. So just to quickly give you a sense of the folk rock I wonder if it's here. Ah, so this is the kind of music produced by the caravan. It's all on YouTube, so just Google Caravan and you will enjoy one hour of folk rock. <laughs> Which is quite nice. Um, and it was really popular back then in the 70s. Everyone listened to this kind of music. Um, right, so going back to... I just gotta look for my slide. It's here. Okay. Yeah, finally, um, I would like to talk about um, Sydney Contextual. And here, um, I would like to talk about the interdiscursivity um, by looking at the new art movement uh, within the context of another literary movement, uh, which was called the um, Sydney Contextual. But before, um, Sydney Sestra, sorry. Uh, but before that, I would like to just talk about the um, <coughs> semi-contextual or contextual art uh, was an idea that was proposed um, very much by artists like um, F.X. Hasono and um, during this time, um, they came up with the idea that art should be about raising a kind of awareness of the people um, through 
um, kind of working with the communities and raising their awareness of social and political issues. And um, this was something that was proposed by a group of artists associated with the Karekan Sinipa Bavro or the New Art Movement in the 1980s. Um, but exactly at this point in time, in the 1980s, there was also another literary movement called um, uh, Sastra Contextual or Contextual Literature. And um, this has to be understood in the context of the new art, sorry, the um, new order regime under Suharto, where new anti-realist writers um, that, that were basically um, in a way patronized by government sponsored <coughs> arts bodies, public publishing media, literary competitions, and, and kind of international reputation, uh, representation in Indonesian arts was really the dominant form uh, in Indonesia, at least uh, in the 1980s. So any traces of social engagement in literary works were expunged and replaced by formal experimentation with language as a hegemonic discourse. So literary production in Indonesia was effectively depoliticized as well as its art at that point in time. Uh, besides, you know, at, you know, instances in which the new art movement kind of resisted that uh, in the 1970s and 80s. So writers like Mokhtar Lubis and uh, Masadi who persevered in contesting hegemonic discourse of literary formalism were marginalized uh, as entertainment literature. They were called entertainment literature as opposed to the serious literature engaged in experimentation in form and content. So a group of anti-establishment intellectuals, writers, and cultural activists who start themselves as contextualists engaged in a discursive struggle, struggle with hegemonic formalist literary discourse based on a premise that all literature manifests universal values, worldviews, and life <coughs> itself. So contextual literature, or sastra contextual, sought to foster a socially engaged literary discourse to challenge the formal structuralist and univers universal humanist literary discourses that were manifestations of a depoliticized literary production in Indonesia. So instead, the literary contextualists aim to question the institutional structures that perpetuate social injustices and actively deploy literature to effect social change to address these injustices. So what distinguished contextual literature from the earlier leftist literature was the contextualist critical approach to all forms of political structures and ideologies. So proponents of the new art movement led by artists like F.X. Hasono were also producing new modes of art making in the 1970s and 80s, paralleled the literary contextualists in the 1980s. So we see connections between uh, semi-contextual and semi-sastra, um, the two. Um, and how these two movements um, was very much part of a broader movement uh, to produce socially engaged um, practices. So the interdiscursivity between contextual literature and contextual art brings to the fore similar concepts of producing socially engaged practices that was critical of hegemonic discourses. The contextual was invented as a new floating signifier from the domain of literary discourse to destabilize the hegemonic exhibitionary discourse of formalism and depoliticization of art represented by art ca academies like Academy Sini Rupa Indonesia in Yogyakarta. So to conclude, um, this paper has discussed about uh, has really unraveled the discursive struggles that centered on the new and the real advanced by artist collectives that produce art manifestos as exhibitionary discourses. While the modern art society imagined themselves as part of a broader global avant-garde movement in the West, other more socially engaged artist collectives forged a new path that provincialized the West while multiplying frames of references that expanded what art could be by encouraging social engagement and self-reflexivity as part of a creative and political struggle towards the decolonization of the region. Collectively, these collectives achieved what um, political theorist Chantel Moore describes as a critical dimension. This critical dimension plays a role in, and I quote, in making the visible what the dominant consensus tends to obscure and obliterate, in giving a voice to those who are silenced within the framework of existing hegemony, unquote. So the interdiscursivity of collectives like the, the Artist Fund of Thailand and the New Art Movement, for example, made visible the significance of local contexts and cultures in determining the role of art and artists as vehicles for dissent. At stake was the scope of what art could be as a vehicle of decolonization. The exhibitionary discourse aimed at rediscovering diverse forms of modernity by including mm -hmm. alternative forms of knowledge production located in the real um, and concrete local practices and experiences. The emergence of socially engaged artist collectives across Southeast Asia in the 1970s became a site for mediating, confronting, and making visible the existence of alternatives that could be harnessed for the process of decolonization in the social political order 
circumscribed by the Cold War. Thank you.